Welcome back to The Breakfast. As always, we go back in history every single day and uh, tell you some things that happened um, on this day. And I'm starting with 1968. It's back to a conversation about racial segregation once again. We've mm -hmm. spoken about this so many times, but it really just shows you that many, many incidents have happened in the past um, that you basically just told a story of, of racial segregation in, in the U.S. and maybe also in other, um, other parts of the world. Um, in 1968, we're looking at um, an incident that happened in something or something called the Orangeburg Massacre. Um, it was uh, about the American Civil Rights Movement at that time, an attack on black students from South Carolina State University who were protesting racial segregation at the town's only bowling alley. Um, it was... Um, on the evening of February 8, 1968, about 200 protesters had previously d demonstrated against racial segregation at a local bowling alley. Three of the protesters at that time, African Americans, were killed and 28 others were injured. Um, it, of course, uh, happened you know, in the fall of 1967. That's where all the, the anger and, um, and the you know, aggression started. Um, where some of the black protesters, or black leaders rather, within the community tried to convince a guy called Harry K. Floyd, the owner of the bowling alley, to allow African Americans in. But he was unwilling to um, desegregate. And of course, uh, that what, uh, is what led to the protest in the early of uh, February 1968. Um, a, a group of around 40 students from the university entered the bowling alley and left peacefully after they were asked to leave by the owner. The next night, more students, led by John Stroman, returned and entered the bowling alley. And this time, there were police waiting for them. Several of them were arrested. And after the arrest, of course, it triggered you know, more anger and more uh, frustration. More, of course, uh, people showed up. There were more protests. Um, and, of course, um, it continued to get even more um, violent and aggressive. A couple of students were sent to the hospital. Over the next couple of days, the tension escalated completely. Student protesters submitted a list of demands, very similar to the NSARS protest, uh, that uh, consisted of integration and the elimination of discrimination within the community. Um, the governor at that time responded by calling the National Guard um, in on the protesters. And it went on and on and on. Um, a bonfire started, um, just like here in Lekki phase on during the um, and, um, and uh, protest. protest, you know, and um, um, eventually about three of these students were killed. Uh, some of them were shot, you know, in the back as they tried to run away. Um, and it continued to just be a mess until things eventually settled down. So th these were some of the things that happened basically in that era um, that forced uh, desegregation of the United States. Same thing, you know, in, in South Africa and other places. Um, but unfortunately, some people um, had to lose their lives. Some people paid the ultimate sacrifice for, uh, um, you know, the, the desegregation in many, many of these cities across the world. Um, and so his respect to them, um, it's a great thing that we're sharing this story today. And we're hoping, really, that in, in, in decades from now, we still aren't telling stories of racial segregation and, and violence and riots and protest uh, because of uh, racism uh, that happens in the current era that we are in. Hopefully in 2050, whoever's telling stories doesn't say, oh, sometime in 2021, there was you know, a fight for racial segregation in yeah. um, many places. Maybe we'll be telling a, a totally different story. Yes, yeah, so sad what happened to those students in, uh, in, in the US. And I just thank God that eventually, you know, the, there was a memorial for them erected in their honor. And uh, just so unfortunate that many, many decades later, we also found incidents of this, with the latest being the uh, protest, you know, against the, the killing George, of uh, George Floyd. Uh, and, and, and one thing, now you mentioned a memorial, I've also heard that uh, as part of the arguments people have about the Lekki Toge. Uh, people say that that place should never be reopened for business or be told ever again, and it should be left as a memorial for those people who lost their lives on the 20th of October uh, 2020. And even in the build-up to the 20th of October, those um, videos that were all over the place of, of people getting shot um, here in Lagos and in other parts of the country, and also those who maybe also lost their lives, you know, in years leading up to 2020 when that protest happened. Mm. Um, th that's been, you know, the argument of a few. It sounds like a very noble thing to do, but we need to understand that at the end of the day, it's a lucky concession company. I'm very sure that for the fact that it's the, a business they run, they've maybe 
paid some amount to the government to be able to operate in that area. And I don't think that they would easily let go. In fact, there have been reports of how much millions of Naira they've lost in the past, you know, since October when, you know, the, the, the protest occurred and the place was shut down. So I really, really doubt that that's going to happen for it to remain permanently shut. But we can only just watch and see since there's even a stalemate right now then with the Lagos panel hearing. Also then makes you wonder, you know, how much of the voice of the people is relevant in conversations like this. They yes, might, they might cite run, a memorial you know? somewhere else, uh, but say, I don't like you talking it. I, I, I doubt that that's going to be a possibility. Well, let's see how it goes. February 8th, 1924. What happened today in history was the first ever execution by lethal gas. So two guys were members of a Chinese gang. They killed somebody and... Uh, they were sentenced, convicted and sentenced to death. And at that time, people who were sentenced to death, you know, died by hanging. But they decided that death by hanging was very, you know, was just very brutal. And that they were going to come up with another way that was more humane to execute criminals. And that way discovered was the uh, use of lethal gas you know, to execute criminals. And a bill authorizing the use of lethal gas passed the Nevada State Legislature in 1921. And uh, when this happened, it means that this guy who had killed someone else, his name was G, he was eligible to be executed by lethal gas, the first person to be executed by this method. At the end of the day, the California Cyanide Company of Los Angeles, California, they didn't want to release their gas to be used for this execution because it was used to eradicate pests at the time. And in fact, people were opposed to this. Even three guards at the prison, you know, actually resigned because they didn't want to be involved with the death of that prisoner by lethal gas. As I said, it was the first time ever this was going to be done. But at the end of the day, the officials, you know, they attempted to first pump, you know, this gas into his prison uh, chamber but at the end of into his prison cell, but they eventually decided to create a makeshift gas chamber at the butcher shop of the prison. And they tested this gas on a cat, at least one cat. The cats died and they said, okay, I think this can work on this uh, murderer, so to speak. And eventually, you know, they, they set up this gas chamber. They put a small window for people to, you know, observe witnesses to look inside. And he, he eventually, he wept, basically. We saw videos of him weeping on the chair until the guards told him to brace up. And at 9.40 a.m., February 8th, 1924, the pump sprayed four pounds of hydrocyanidic acid into the chamber. He appeared to lose consciousness in about five seconds and his head continued to nod up and down for six minutes. And at the end of the day, at about 10 a.m., events was opened up, a fan was turned on to discharge the poison gas. And I remember the doctors, I don't remember because I wasn't there, <laughs> I mean, from what I read, right? Yes. The doctors refused to do an autopsy for fear that when they opened the body, the gas might escape and, you know, uh, affect other people. G was 29 years old when he was executed by lethal gas. But since then, you know, lethal gas was a method of carrying out capital punishment. And it was eventually replaced by lethal injection in the late 20th century. And I did some digging to see just how the, what the statistics are saying about death by lethal gas, lethal injection in the US. And uh, even globally, what I'm seeing here is that from 1976 to February 19, to February 2021, there have been 1,529 executions, out of which 1,349 were by lethal injection. We saw that 163 um, murderers were executed by electrocution. I mean, that's just terrible. Even though statistics say they die in about two to three seconds, they strap you onto the chair, you get electrocuted, and in just a short period of time, the person's out. And then 11 people died by gas inhalation, three by hanging, three by firing squad. But since 1999, the number of executions have you know, greatly been limited or decreased. And uh, there were 17 executions in the US in the year 2020, and it was the 
lowest number of executions we've seen in the U.S. since the year 1991. It's interesting, you know, and, you know, the way you've described it, you know, I believe is some of the reasons there has been a conversation about ending the death penalty completely. Um, and, you know, you even have um, legal, um, you know, issues, you know, with the way a person is um, killed. Um, even if the person has been sentenced to death um, by either lethal injection or by hanging, whichever one it is, mm -hmm. there's also uh, people who have argued that it is still an illegal way to, you know, end the person's life. And so they want to completely uh, kick away the death uh, penalty. penalty. Um, and they, um, of course, have, you know, their own um, emotions and sentiments, you know, towards that. Mm. But um, in some places, it still is in existence. In other places, of course, it has been completely ruled out. Yes. Um, do you think that people should die because, you know, they've committed crimes or not? And if you agree that they should die, how should they die? You know, how, in what way can they go through the, you know, smallest bit of suffering before they eventually um, um, yeah. die? So. Um, it's it's great conversations, you know, and of course in the developing world, every now and then these things would always come up um, to to uh, um, give us a you know a finer way of living and a, and a finer way of also ending a person's life. Yeah, and I saw that actually that it's more expensive for the state to execute a prisoner than to incarcerate him for life. I have no idea how Ooh. that happens because you know there are considerations of th these people wouldn't starve in prison, would they? There's considerations of. Okay, there's just so many things to put in yes. to put in consideration, but the stats say it's more expensive for them to actually execute a prisoner than to keep him in jail him. for life. All right, that's all we have for you. 1968 and 1924. 1924. All right, our two dates for um, uh, today in history: the 8th of February, many many years ago. Stay with us. Next, we're having a discussion about the Lekki toll gate. Uh, what you um, your thoughts are really? Um, um, about whether it should be reopened or not. It, you know, is that, um, has the uh, panel basically done what it was set up to do in the first place? So we'll, we'll come back after the short break and talk about that.